Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today to talk about the concepts and connections behind the practice of continuous integration with Salesforce DX. My name is David Reed. My hope today with this session is to create and send you home with a conceptual framework to understand what continuous integration is, what the architecture behind this solution looks like, and how you can start to apply it to your own development practice in your org. So we'll build out the con that conceptual framework through this talk, and we'll start to hang some concrete specifics at different places throughout that framework. So you have some touch points that you can anchor with. And then I want to give you the tools beyond that to go home and start to flesh out what that architecture might look like as you apply it in your unique Salesforce org and your development process based upon the needs that your organization has articulated. So let's get started here. Again, my name is David Reed. I'm a senior Salesforce developer at Radian. I'm a Salesforce certified platform developer too. And some of my particular interests and passions on the Salesforce platform have to do with tooling and infrastructure. The tools that we use, the practices that we use to do our jobs as implementers of software systems on the Salesforce platform. And in particular, I'm interested in taking and making use of practices and tools and frameworks that have been developed in other software development stacks over the course of many years and bringing home those methodologies to the Salesforce platform and learning how to apply them in ways that uh, work with and extend the unique constraints and benefits and advantages of the platforms that we work on. One of the big things um, that falls within that realm, of course, is continuous integration. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So I want to get us started with a conceptual introduction to what continuous integration is. I'm going to say CI a lot because this is kind of a long phrase here. And what CI is going to look like when we start to use it in a Salesforce DX context, using this new development methodology and tooling chain that Salesforce has built out for us over the last 18 months or so. Continuous integration at the core is a methodology for building software. Building software um, in a way where we run our tests constantly and automatically throughout our development life cycle. And I want to kind of draw out the distinction here between a discrete and a continuous testing process. Uh, if you're working in a more traditional software development um, lifecycle uh, uh, pipeline experience, you may have a testing phase. That would be a, a discrete integration and testing process, a defined phase where you hand over the work that you have done to someone else who's part of your team. That might be a, a testing team, for example, or a UAT group that will take what you've done that you've probably tested for yourself and move that code or metadata or flow and process or what have you into an environment where they can put it together with everything else that makes up your Salesforce org and makes it look like the org that your users know and love and then perform some tests there. That's your, your integration testing, your user acceptance testing. What we're going to do with continuous integration is take that discrete testing phase and start to spread it out to make it continuous throughout the development life cycle, not to be a discrete phase that comes somewhere towards the end of what we do every day as implementers and solution builders. We're going to do that by running our tests, as we say, continuously, constantly, throughout the process. And we're going to run them in an integrated context. What I mean by that is we go beyond uh, a practice where we build a feature, say feature A, and then test feature A before we push feature A on and give it over to someone who's going to run it in the context of a whole organization and see how it works. Instead, what we're going to do is run those tests continuously across your whole organization. That's the integration part of the continuous integration piece here. Integration means we're running all the tests, everything in our organization as a whole, because when it's brought out to your users, of course, it is a whole. And as, as software developers, we need to see at every stage of what we're doing how our work integrates into that entire organization, all the code and metadata that has been developed and that is being developed as part of our software development process. In order to achieve this continuous integration of our testing and our developing work, we're going to be focusing on a couple of facets. One of them is the use of scripting to reduce or eliminate human intervention in the testing process. When we do unit testing on Salesforce in Apex, that's usually a process that doesn't involve a whole lot of human intervention. Most of our orgs have moved past the days where we're using see all data equals true. So we don't have to do a lot of death test data setup. It's largely automated. 
Integration testing, on the other hand, often involves a little bit more human intervention. You might be setting up environments. You might be building connections to other integrated systems. You might be doing load or volume testing. There's lots of different places where a human being can be involved. And many of them have to do with the setup, the context of the, where your tests are going to be run. Those are things we're going to work to be eliminating with our CI solution. We're going to be building into software so that they can be run without that investment of human capital and programmer time that could better be spent building more software instead of testing what's already been done. Another facet that we're going to be focusing on as part of building this architecture and infrastructure out is a focus on consistency and repeatability of our testing process. If you think about the idea of running your tests all the time, you're going to be getting a kind of fire hose of data out of that process. And when you run your tests, you get back code coverage information, you get back test success and failures, you get back stack traces and exception messages if, heaven forfend, you've caused a bug or a regression somewhere. And we want to be able to make sure that that data that comes back to us is meaningful. The way we do that is by controlling some sources of skew, test results that don't reflect the actual success or failure of our code that come from sources like a mismatch between the environment that we expect when we run the test and the environment where we're actually running it. Or they might come from artifacts left behind pieces of metadata or left behind pieces of data coming from a previous test run. If you're already practicing development with Salesforce DX, you might see where I'm going with this. This is where we slot in Salesforce DX scratch orgs that allow us to control those environments a little more finely than we're used to in a practice that uses long-lived sandboxes, where, for example, you can't always cleanly roll back a deployment and make sure that all of your artifacts and side effects have been taken care of. We'll dig a lot more into that later. But I just want to give you as sort of a couple of touchstones that we'll continue coming back to consistency and repeatability of our testing process and automation and scripting of our testing process as the touch points of for how we're going to implement these solutions. You may have noticed, if you're in the audience and you're not a developer who writes code every day, that I am using a lot of developer language. I'm talking about code, I'm talking about Apex unit tests. And that's because I'm a developer. That's my inherent bias. That's the world I live in and what I think about when I'm building software. But I want to emphasize as well that a CI solution isn't just for developers in the sense that it's not just built by developers and it doesn't just provide value to the developers on your team. In particular, if you are building solutions on Salesforce in a declarative way, if you're an admin or an admin developer, and you work alongside developers or you work in an organization that has existing code, or if you're a solution architect who works with developers and admins to build this software, or if you're a release manager or a lifecycle manager, or if you're a leadership figure on a development team who needs insight into where your features stand along the development process, CI is a tool that can provide you with insight and value as well, even if you have never written an Apex unit test in your life. Another thing I want to emphasize here is that even though I'm going to continue using developer-centric verbiage, I'm going to ask your indulgence if you're not a developer. And when I say code, read code and metadata, because that's what I really mean here. Part of the integration aspect of CI that I mentioned before is that we're not just focusing on Apex unit tests taken alone. We're also focusing on the environment around them. All of the declarative metadata, like custom object definitions, flows and processes, workflow rules, validation rules, even page layouts that make your org look like your org and define the context in which your code operates and in which your code's unit test runs. So code should be taken throughout this presentation to mean code and metadata. And admins, I'll again ask your indulgence if I'm using developer-centric verbiage, but I want to include you as well and make sure, which I'll show you concretely in a few minutes, that admins and declarative solution builders are very much a part of the continuous integration landscape and can benefit from what we're getting out of this solution as well. We're going to be looking at CI today from a couple of different perspectives, but I want to start from a user perspective. And by user, I don't mean an end user of Salesforce, but I mean you as a developer or an admin or someone else who's working as part of the development lifecycle to build solutions on Salesforce. I'm using the word code here again, but what I mean is we're building something. We're building a new feature on our Salesforce application. And what the CI flow looks like from our perspective as that individual is we're going to do some development work, whatever that looks like. Could be building a new flow, could be building a new Apex class or trigger. We're going to commit that code to a version control repository, which if you're using Salesforce DX, you'll know represents the source of truth 
the central location where your team stores and coordinates the history of your project. And when you do that, when you take that step to push your work out into your team's central repository, you get back some immediate feedback that lets you know where you stand. Is your code working? Is it causing problems for the work that the other members of your team are doing or for features that have been previously implemented in your org? Or is everything looking good and might be ready to move forward to user acceptance or even deployment to production? You write code, you do development, you push, and then you get feedback. And I want to show you what this looks like as a quick, concrete taste of how CI can play a role in your day-to-day -day development experience. I'm going to show you a two-minute video here. It took me 10 minutes to film this, just so you get a sense of what the actual timeline looks like, and show you how two people who are working on the same feature in the same Salesforce org can benefit from sharing a CI infrastructure that will give them both feedback about the integration between the work that they're doing and the extent to which it's successful or not. So as I start out here, I'm a developer. And you can see that I'm finishing up creating an Apex unit test for a piece of functionality that I'm working on. I'm in Visual Studio Code here. And I'm working with Salesforce DX. This may be a little bit hard to read, and I apologize, but I'm committing my work here on this unit test to my version control system, and I'm pushing it up to my team's version control server. I get a notification. In this case, it's an email notification letting me know that my tests have passed. Now, in real life, that took about a minute and a half for me to get that. I'm putting on my admin hat here. Conceptually, maybe I'm another member of the team, and I'm working on a validation rule. Part of this same feature, it's in a sandbox. It looks like people have been creating some test data or dummy data in production, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Nobody wants their production org to be polluted. If you have good eyes, you might have noticed that my unit test that I just wrote is going to have a bit of a problem with this because my unit test is inserting dummy data to run a test against it. So what I'm doing here as an admin is I'm pulling down this metadata that I just created in Salesforce DX in a scratch org, and again, I'm committing it. I'm pushing that up to my team's version control repository where it's going to be integrated with the rest of the work that's happening, including the unit test I just wrote as, an administra as a developer. As soon as I do that push, again, my CI solution's going off. My tests are running. They're continuous. I'm going to get a notification in a moment here. Here it is. And it's letting me know that I have a problem. I've introduced a regression. One of my unit tests has failed. Fortunately, this message gives me enough information to immediately identify the source of the problem. I'm going to put my developer hat back on here. I'm switching over to look at my unit test, where you can see that I'm creating data that contravened the validation rule my admin compatriot just created. I introduce a quick fix to this unit test. Fortunately, this is a very shallow regression, and hopefully a lot of our regressions are. I push up to the server my changes that I've just made to fix that unit test. And again, it's integrated with the work that my admin compatriot has done. Now my, my board is green, my tests are passing, and I'm ready to move forward. Both of us, the admin and the developer, are ready to move forward with the work that we've done because we know immediately from the point that we commit whatever the smallest unit of work is that we're completing, whether or not it's working, not just in itself, but in the context of our whole organization and all the work that the rest of the team is doing. This, yes, is a slightly artificial circumstance because I'm working in a very small org here. So in real life, you might be waiting a minute or two minutes or three minutes before you get your test feedback back. But what I want you to see from this example is that the, the feedback loop can be extremely tight. You're not waiting to push your code to a different sandbox to integrate it with the work of someone else on your team. You're doing it in real time, or as close to real time as you can possibly get, and you know right away if something that you have done is going to be causing problems down the line. And you can fix it before it gets out of your individual uh, scratch org that you're working in. So I think you see a little bit of what I'm going to tell you about the value proposition of CI from that demonstration, but I want to hone in on a couple of specific aspects here. One of the primary benefits of CI is the visibility that it gives you into your whole code base, not just the unit where you happen to be working at any given time. Throughout your development process, CI is going to be surfacing to you, are your tests passing across your whole org? Again, have you introduced any regressions in the work that you've done that might impact something that's already been deployed to production or something another member of your team is working on? Do you have the right overall test coverage to be able to move your Apex into production? And are you following coding best practices in the work that you're doing? Again, this is, this is aimed at bringing those bugs and issues that potentially would surface much later in the development process in a traditional workflow, bringing them to you very early so you can address them before they have a much higher cost, before they move out of your hands and have to be found by someone else at a later stage in your process. Another great benefit of CI is an overall reduction in risk, the risk that's always inherent in the software development process. 
When you're running CI against your code, you're never going to unknowingly merge something broken into your integration branch, into your long-lived sandboxes, or heaven forbid, even into production. You find more regressions faster without having to wait on manual or human-mediated test cycles because those test cycles are automatic and they're continuous. They're running all the time and giving you those results as you're performing your work. You always have an eye on the areas of risk within your code base and within the work that you're doing. You see here, I was working on the project, and this is a, a Circle CI example, that had four branches. And I can immediately see at a glance that I have one branch that's got problems. I know I can't move that branch forward in its current state. I can't merge it into master or take it to production. But I've got three other branches, including master, that I know are good to go right now. And I know that I'm good to go right now with all of the code that I've developed to date and committed to my version control. That allows you actually to iterate and branch without introducing chaos in a way that you might in a more traditional development workflow. If you're used to working in long-lived sandboxes, for example, you might have encountered situations where you build multiple features, you push those features into your sandboxes, you try to test them, and you find your test results conflicting with one another. You find metadata from one branch overwriting another or conflicting with another in ways that you don't expect because you haven't looked at those features in combination yet. When, you, when that happens, you run into a situation where your test results may not be all that meaningful to you. You may be getting confusing results simply because you've got issues with your environment, you've got artifacts left over from other test runs or other features that you've been building. But when you're using CI with DX, and we can take away or even abstract away those environmental issues, you have the freedom to do a lot of iteration and branching, trying new things, um, introducing new features that may ultimately never go anywhere without introducing chaos into your process because you've always got this visibility into what's going on throughout your code base. And lastly, CI helps you to inculcate what I call a virtuous feedback cycle in how you do your development. The utility of continuous integration goes up when you do development following best practices, when you write really good high quality unit tests that are not data dependent, that are um, isolated from one another effectively, that test every code path, that have high code coverage. That's what lets your CI solution bring up all those bugs to you very early in the development process. Conversely, because your CI solution makes use of those tests, it actually helps you to write better tests. The feedback that you get will, will teach you where you need to be investing your effort and how you need to be shaping your tests to be most effective at bringing out those issues early and making sure that you don't introduce any regressions. So you get a feedback cycle. You test really often. That helps you write better tests. As you write better tests that perform better, that test more effectively, you can run them more often. It, iter it iterates back and loops back in on itself. So ultimately, you're converging on really good development practices and really good testing practices where all of these frameworks and architectures that you're using feed into one another. So I want to turn the page here. We've been looking at the developer um, or admin or user facing aspect of CI. But what we're going to dig in on here is this black box, the points between when you push your code up to version control and when you get feedback. And look at the framework of what this continuous integration solution is actually doing behind the scenes. So we're gonna dig in on this, on this step here between the push and the feedback that you receive. And there's three primary components to look at here. Version control, Salesforce DX, and your CI provider. Your version control, as I mentioned earlier, is your source of truth. In the DX world, Everything that is true, that is your golden source of work and the history of your project lives in Git or in Mercurial or some other version control system. That's where your team is coordinating its work. That's where all the work that you've done lives and all the history of your project. Salesforce DX encompasses both your production org, which is the dev hub. That's where all of your Salesforce DX scratch orgs are linked to. That's what you use to create new scratch orgs. And it also generates scratch orgs for you. I'm analogizing here scratch orgs to a container in the Salesforce sense, because we're going to be using containers a lot on the CI side. And that's what allows us to do this environmental control, where we can manipulate and control and script the environment in which all of our tests are running. And then the last is your CI provider, which is running this whole process behind the scenes. It's the mediator. It's uh, the middleware, in a sense, that runs this whole architecture. Your version control is your source of truth, and there's two aspects or two halves even to this. One is your own version control on your machine. You have a clone of your team's repository where you're doing your work on a day-to-day -day basis. You might be checking in code as you go even before it's finished. 
You could be checking in a flow that doesn't work all the way. You could be checking in a new custom object where you're still adding fields or a unit test where you haven't quite written out all of your cases yet. When you complete your work to a certain point, to a, a unit of work that you're ready to push up and share with the rest of your team, that's when you push from your local repository up to your team's source of truth, your Git version control server. And that's the point at which CI takes over and starts to run your tests. It is possible to run CI on your own local machine. It's relatively less common. Typically, what you're going to see is that it's going to be wired up to your team's version control server. That also gives you a little more freedom because you can make your check-ins locally as often as you want to. You don't have to be committing a complete unit of work locally. When you've got that complete unit of work, that's when you push it up to your team's server and then you get your tests to start running. Your Salesforce DX scratch orgs form the location of your work and also the location of the testing work that's being executed behind the scenes. You may have one or more scratch orgs that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to build your code and your declarative customizations. Your team members have their own scratch orgs as well. You don't share them in the way that one might traditionally share a long-lived sandbox. You spin them up, you do some work, you pull that work down and commit it to Git, and then you throw them away. They're disposable, and they start empty. Again, this is the, um, this is the integrative aspect of continuous integration with Salesforce DX. Your, your scratch orgs start completely empty. They're just vanilla Salesforce. They don't look anything like production. When you push all your code and metadata up to your scratch org, that's what makes it look like a production org. And that's what makes it look actually like the future state of your production org as you add new customization on top of what's already there. So you and your teammates are doing that development in your Salesforce DX scratch orgs. Your CI provider is also spinning up scratch orgs in the background to run the tests that you're asking it to do. You never see those scratch orgs. They're spun up, they're used to run a test once, and then they're thrown away. One of the key facets that we talked about at the beginning of running tests continuously and automatically and being able to rely on the results of those tests is that they have to be reproducible and they have to have no side effects. If they have any side effects in an, in a, in an org, in an instance of Salesforce that you're gonna use again, you lose that consistency. Your ability to say, I know I'm running my test with the same input in the same situation and I can rely on getting the same results out of them. That's why it's so important to use these disposable scratch orgs because you set it up using a script to always look the same way, you run your test, then you throw it away. You never have to worry about any artifacts, any side effects, any data issues. And the last big piece is this continuous integration provider. It's keying off of changes that you push to Git, as we said. You make, you make your push from your local Git repository up to your team's server, and in the background, the CI provider takes over. It sees those changes, checks out your latest code, and then it starts running. And what it starts running is what you've told it to do, because this is a process that is going to be entirely bespoke to your organization. You get to define what the CI flow looks like in terms of what processes need to happen to set up your org, what you need to do to lay the groundwork for your tests, how the tests get executed, and how the results get reported to you. And that can look pretty much any way you want it to in terms of result reporting. The idea here is that wherever you're doing your work, you should be getting your results there. So if you're on your email all day every day, you should be getting an email letting you know, hey, your test passed from your latest commit. If you're in Slack all day every day, you should have your CI provider integrated into Slack to send you a message and say, you know, a commit with this SHA hash has succeeded. Your tests are good. Um, if you're sitting in CircleCI or whatever your CI provider is, you should be able to watch there and see your tests execute in real time and get your results back. The idea is that you should never have to go and look. It should always be presented to you and made available to you where you are operating so you don't have to do anything extra to know what's going on in your code. I wanna dig a little bit deeper here into the connections between these systems though. I mentioned a moment ago that the CI server just starts up when you make a commit to Git. Let's look at the actual flow of messages between these systems. We're gonna push up to our Git repository. And again, this is the Git repository that's on your central version control server, not the copy that you've got locally where you're doing your own work, maybe even maintaining local feature branches. A message is going out from your Git server to the CI server to let it know that a commit has taken place. And when that happens, your CI server is gonna spin up a container. We've got, we're gonna have two containers in scope here. One is the virtual machine, the container, that your CI server is using to execute the testing flow. And that's likely to be a Linux container. It doesn't have to be, but in many cases it'll be a Linux container, like Ubuntu or something similar, where you're gonna run a script. We'll dig into that script in a minute, but just take it as the flow that you've defined for what you need to do to execute your tests and get back results. 
your CI server spins up one of these virtual machines and asks it to execute the CI flow that you have defined with the source. The source, again, is not just the feature that you are working on, but it's the entire source code to your organization. Apex, JavaScript, custom objects, validation rules, all the metadata that makes your org look like your org. The CI container is gonna reach out as part of this scripted process we've defined to your production Salesforce org. It's not performing a deploy. It's just asking for a new Salesforce DX scratch org. We build that new scratch org and then we push into it all of that code and metadata to make it look like the future state of production based upon the work that you've done and committed to your version control server. Then we execute the tests and we execute them only in this context, in the scratch org. It's the brand new scratch org. It looks like your future state. There's nothing left over in that scratch org from any previous deployment. If you perform two commits in a single day and those both get pushed into your integration sandbox, a long lived sandbox, you have to worry about whether your second commits test results are gonna be affected by what happened when you made that first commit. You don't have to do that here because every test run is completely independent of every previous test run. Your scratch org runs the tests and it's gonna push those test results back to your CI server and they're gonna to come to you through whatever mechanism you've established to get that result reporting in. Hopefully everything looks good and you can move forward. So as we've seen, Salesforce DX and the continuous integration server rely on containers in different ways. I'm thinking about a DX scratch org as a kind of Salesforce container. In CircleCI, which is the example that I'm using throughout this presentation, we use a Docker virtual environment to be the, the location where we're running our CI flow, which is executing a shell script or a series of shell scripts to define our build phases. What this does for us is both allows us to achieve that automation that we talked about as a necessary condition to run our tests in a continuous fashion. And it also allows us to flexibly plug in different tools throughout the builds, the series of build steps that we're going to define to do whatever our org needs. And one thing we're going to delve into in a few minutes is where you can go in that process beyond simply running tests. This is an architecture that allows you to add hooks, to add new functionality plugged in throughout the sequence of steps that you execute when you perform a git commit. And that can do not just testing and test reporting, it can do code coverage reporting, it can do a whole variety of test operations that go beyond a single org, a single org type, and it can extend beyond the Salesforce platform as well. We'll dig into that a little bit. But first I wanna look at briefly at what defines a Salesforce org. Because again, when we spin up these Salesforce DX scratch orgs um, to run our tests, they are completely vanilla, empty bone stock Salesforce instances. When we wanna make those DX scratch orgs look like production, there's three very broad sections where we can customize them. One is the addition and feature set. Those are things that you, you pay Salesforce for. They're part of your Salesforce contract. Another is the declarative customization that you do in setup, like turning on person accounts, for example, or turning on contacts to multiple accounts. Those are things you don't necessarily think of as being defined in source code, but they're necessary to make your environment look like your production so your test results will be meaningful to you. And the last is your source and metadata, all the work that you and your teammates do to customize your org and present the view that your users expect. All of these things are part of our CI process. We shape the DX scratch org in a couple of different ways to make it look the way we need it to. One is the, the definition of our scratch org that we use with Salesforce DX in the form of a JSON config file that takes in a lot of the core edition feature set type um, parameters that we need. So that's a constant part of your CI infrastructure that you set up once and largely don't change. You can also make tweaks by doing metadata API deploys or using a tool like Selenium to do user interface automation for those few edge cases that Salesforce DX does not yet support in terms of configuring features. Um, within your org. You can see here we're setting up a, an org that has person accounts, sites, and communities. Your org might have a completely different feature set or you might use multiple orgs that have different feature sets. Your config file will define what that, what that scratch org looks like for you. The other piece that we're gonna be using here is that container, that virtual environment where we're executing the build process. There's again three very broad categories for how we shape that container. We pick a base image that creates the Docker virtualized environment that might be Ubuntu or another Linux distribution. 
We install software on that container that allows us to execute the steps we need. That's always going to include Salesforce DX, but it also might include a Java environment, it might include Node.js, it might be Python, it might be something else. That's going to depend very much on what you need to do as part of your testing process, and every org will be a little bit different. This is another place where you get to make this a bespoke process for your organization. And lastly, again, you've got your source and metadata in that org. You shape your container by picking an, an image, and then you execute a series of shell scripts. Let's look a little bit about, at what that can do. There's very few limits on what you can do once you're scripting this container up in the cloud. Your build steps, um, which again are these individual shell scripts that you write that run in sequence on your container, they can check out your source code, the work that you've just done and committed. They can install software like Salesforce DX. They can connect to your Salesforce DX scratch org load data for doing something like a volume or a performance test. They can run your unit tests. They can run off-platform code. Here I'm running a Python tool that authenticates to that scratch org via the Salesforce API and runs an integration test. And they can do more with, uh, by connecting to other services that we're going to go over in just a moment. So you've got a tremendous amount of freedom here in terms of what you can include in your build process. That's why the use of containerization and scripting is so important in CI, because you're not limited to what's been done before or what comes out of the box. You have full freedom. You have root on this container up in the cloud. And you have the full freedom to incorporate tools that you create or tools that others have created, plug them together in a fluid way to achieve what you need to do by taking off the shelf components and putting them in a unique sequence and a unique configuration to achieve your org's testing objectives. So those are the key principles that I really wanted you to take away from this container focus, this scripting focus of how we automate these tests. You're getting automation and reproducibility out of this architecture. Once you're scripting with your CI process, you have enormous power to add more tools, now or in the future, whatever those might be. And you're taking advantage of prior art, whether that prior art is done on the Salesforce platform or on another platform entirely in terms of the state of, of testing, and you're innovating. You're taking all that off-the-shelf material, different tools that may not have been used be together before, and you're putting them together in a, a unique configuration for your org to get what you need done finished. That might mean learning a lot of new technologies that don't necessarily have any direct connection to the Salesforce platform. It could be Python, it could be Git or Mercurial, you could be using Docker, even creating custom Docker images for your CI virtual machines, writing a lot of bash scripts or using a different scripting languages, language, and so on and so forth. There's almost no limits in terms of what you can do um, to put together the solution that fits your specific objectives. So I want to finish by giving you a kind of tasting menu for where you can go next. Um, these are a selection, not, not an exhaustive selection, but a selection of the tools that you can take off the shelf and plug in to a CI process that you've defined to add more value over and above this base of constantly testing and getting back results, um, and adding more value particularly for your developers and for the other members of your team who need this visibility. One, piece, uh, one new tool that you can add is code coverage monitoring and vis visualization. You're probably used to running your tests in developer console or some other IDE, getting your code coverage results back in that way. If you're running your tests in the background or if a script is running them in the background for you, you're not going to get a chance to look at that code coverage. So you may want to plug in another piece in your process to snapshot that information and present it to you. Um, CodeCov is one service that does this. Um, I happen to like this service because I wrote to them and asked them nicely to support Apex, and they said, sure. So this is a service where you can feed your code coverage information in and get back pretty graphs that show you which lines you cover in a specific commit. So you can trace this throughout the history of your project and get alerting as part of that result reporting to let you know when you've encountered a drop in code coverage and make sure that you're continuing to meet the metrics that Salesforce has defined for the platform that will allow you to go forward to production. Another piece you can add is static analysis using PMD or a number of other tools and cloud services. I like PMD because it's a free open source product, and you can plug it into your process in a number of different locations. As I show you here, you can run PMD right in your IDE in Visual Studio Code, and it'll let you know if you're following coding best practices, like keeping your SQL and DML out of loops. 
if you're following naming conventions that your organization has defined as best practice for your code. There's a number of different checks you can run on both your Apex and your JavaScript and Visual Force right at the coding level. But you can also run PMD in the cloud as part of your continuous integration process to make sure it's applied evenly across all of your developers. And also, you, you might choose to enforce different rules at the level of CI and at the IDE level to make sure you catch different classes of issues as they happen and before they get merged into your development main line. Here, I'm showing you that uh, your, your static analysis can, analysis can be one of a number of different checks that are run as part of your CI process and that are all reported to you in your GitHub or your other version control solution every single time a commit happens. The Lightning Testing Service is another piece you can plug into this puzzle. LTS in particular benefits enormously from the use of Salesforce DX and continuous integration because unlike Apex, Lightning unit tests, which can use either Mocha or Jasmine as JavaScript testing frameworks, do not have an isolated test context. In Apex, as you know, you never have to worry about the data that you create polluting your production org. That's not the case with JavaScript unit tests. There's no test isolation. That means you have to run them in a scratch org. You have to be able to discard the environment when you're finished. It's a perfect fit for CI because in addition to running in a disposable scratch org, you can run your lightning tests in parallel with Apex on two separate scratch orgs at the same time. You don't have to do these things in sequence. So it doesn't slow down your testing process and you can keep those two testing processes isolated. They run alongside one another and then merge back together to give you results in a single step. If you're building code that runs in different Salesforce orgs, whether you're an ISV or you're a company that maintains multiple production Salesforce orgs, or you're working on an open source project that needs to be able to in be installed in a variety of different environments, you may want to be able to say, my code works for sure on my production environment, which is a Salesforce unlimited edition, but it'll also work in a professional edition, or it'll also work in an environment that has person accounts, or an environment that is multi-currency, or an environment that has contacts to multiple accounts turned on. These are all things that you can incorporate into your testing process by defining more than one scratch org shape as part of your CI process. Again, these are things that you can run in parallel. They fan out, you create multiple scratch orgs at a single instance, push all of your code and metadata up into each of those scratch orgs that look different from one another, run your tests, and then get back reporting that spans that whole gamut of different configurations to let you know where your code is and is not working successfully. You can also, as I mentioned earlier, expand your testing beyond the edge of the Salesforce platform. If you are building code that operates in an integrated environment that connects to a Salesforce org, but maybe is not written in Apex or not written in JavaScript, you can use Salesforce DX as part of your continuous integration practice for that code as well. This is an example here of testing a tool written in Python that connects to the Salesforce API and performs some work. Naturally, you're gonna have unit tests for that tool written in Python or Java or whatever language you're working in, but you're also going to want, as part of your process, to run an integration test against a real Salesforce org. Naturally, you can't do that with a long-lived sandbox or with your production org for the same reasons you wouldn't run your Salesforce Apex tests in that context. You want them to be repeatable and you don't wanna leave behind any artifacts. This is another situation where you can spin up your Salesforce DX scratch org, connect to that scratch org over the API, run your Python, Java, Ruby, or other language tool, execute those integration tests, and get back your results without leaving behind any contamination in your real Salesforce environments. And lastly, you can extend your continuous integration practice by building a continuous deployment architecture on top of it. This is an example from an excellent piece on the Salesforce developer blog that I encourage all of you to look at that shows how you can build unlocked packages as part of your continuous integration process and move towards continuous deployment, where you're able to take that code that you've tested successfully in your disposable scratch orgs and move it into your long-lived sandboxes like a UAT environment or move it directly to your production environment. And you can set the conditions under which those things happen, whether that be a successful test run, human approval, um, successful execution of a static analysis pass to show that you're using coding best practices or other criteria that you yourself define in accordance with what your org needs to be satisfied that you're ready to move forward and do a deployment. I wanna leave you with a few links and resources to go further. 
In particular, I'd like to highlight that the Salesforce Developer blog has been publishing some really great content lately on continuous integration, Salesforce DX, and continuous deployment. I want to encourage all of you to read both the five-part series, Getting Started with Salesforce DX, as well as their recent material on continuous deployment. It's really excellent stuff showing you the state of the art on development and deployment best practices on Salesforce DX. There's a very, a very good Salesforce DX trailhead module that will show you how to set up a CI process using uh, Travis. I showed you examples using Circle CI, but again, all these principles really work regardless of what your specific tech stack looks like, whether you're using Travis, Jenkins, Circle CI, or what have you. And lastly, all of the code that I showed you as part of this presentation is available on my GitHub, Circle CI SFDX examples. That will give you an example of how to do a simple CI process, how to use the lightning testing service, test across multiple org types, incorporate uh, integration tests with tools written in other languages, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's where you can find all the material for, from this presentation. And that's what I've got for you today. Thank you very much for coming. So I have about 30 seconds left of my allotted time, um, but I'm told there's no presentation immediately following this, so I'm happy to take questions if you have any. There's a microphone right over here. There's a microphone right here in the aisle, or you can shout and I might hear you. Yeah, just on the admin, you, the use case of the admin doing mm -hmm. their changes and then having to go to VS Code to uh -huh. commit, what's your thoughts around how to make that process uh, easier for admins around interacting with DX? That's a great question. Um, there are a number of really good tools that give you a graphical interface to Git. And one of the easiest to use is actually Visual Studio Code. Um, the Salesforce extensions for VS Code give you a command palette that will allow you to pull down the metadata changes that you make in your Scratch org and commit them directly to Git without ever touching a command line. So that's one way that you can do it if you standardize on Visual Studio Code. There's also a lot of good Git GUIs for every operating system. GitHub Desktop is a good one. Um, I think that's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So if you have admins on your team who really prefer the graphical interface or developers who prefer the graphical interface, they've got a lot of different choices. But Visual Studio Code is a good place to start. Thank you.